I looked into the eyes of my cousin. I could see terror. He was looking back at me, and I was in big trouble. A 500-pound piece of steel just fell 20 feet, landing on my left hand, nearly missing my head just by inches. I looked back at George. He reacted quickly. He grabbed the chain, idled the rig up, wrapped it around, and lifted it off, the, off my hand. That moment, I took a mangled hand. I was 19 years old, and I pressed it up against my body. We were in the middle of nowhere in British Columbia. That was a moment that would change my life. I didn't know how bad it was. At that point, I had all of my hand cut off except a half inch of skin. The tendons were back up in my arm, and the blood supply was pumping full steam with every heartbeat. We raced to town. The mistake we made was we didn't turn the blood off in my arm, didn't know to, just held it pressed against my chest like this. As I leaned over, I remember the image that I had an unbelievably difficult time getting out of my mind was watching the blood slosh back and forth as we went down a gravel road. We were 30 minutes from town. We were in the bush. When I woke up in the Plastics and Burns Unit in Vancouver General, that was about the next memory I had, my hand was the size of a watermelon and I was in a fog. But I knew I wanted nothing to do with those drilling rigs again. I knew I had taken a wrong turn in my life. Have you ever had a situation where you knew you were on the wrong path, that you maybe didn't have a wake-up call like that, but all of a sudden it dawned on you where I do not want to do what I'm doing right now? And that's what happened to me. I want to share with you my story and how my life got to where it is today, how I found what I call my sweet spot in life. This is not a place, it's not a destination, it's not an end, it's not a million dollar house on a hill. This is a place where you find yourself right now. The changes in our life, it's a dynamic. It changes from when we're young to when we're older to, or when you have an injury like this come onto your life. I wanna share with you my story of how I got there. To me, a sweet spot in life is when you find yourself on a path that is because of your hopes, your dreams, your desires versus your fears, versus your anxiety or your history. It's a place that uh, I summed up well in just one short little sentence by Nelson Mandela. He said, may your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. When I was a young boy, I wanted to be with horses. And I didn't want to just be with horses because that's where all the girls were. I actually liked the horses. <laughs> but that's me at 13 years old, and that's at a half a million acre ranch called the Kloshana Cattle Company in British Columbia. And that was my mount at the time named Lightning Leon. He was the slowest horse on the place. <laughs> By the time I was 15, I had begged my parents, let me out of school. I want to get on the ranch. I want to be with horses. So I was able to take homeschool and spend more time on the ranch. As I got better and I was given more responsibility, there was something I got to do every day on the ranch, and that was to bring the horses in. We called it jingle them. So the horses lived in a pasture behind us. It was about 600 acres. There was about 30 head out there. And the rule was that horses eat before people eat. So somebody had to get up earlier than all the rest of the cowboys and cowgirls, go out and bring them in. So sometimes Lightning and Leon was my mount. We'd ride through that pasture, and we called it jingling because sometimes the horses had a bell. So we'd go out there, we'd ride out there and find them. They could be in the far back corner. It was dark. Sometimes it's just the moon or the stars out. You'd finally find those horses, and you had to get them down into the cow camp here. So it would start out slow. They'd start trotting, you know, maybe walking at first, and then next thing you know, the speed would pick up. And those horses would start to move. And the thing that struck me at the time was horses can move so amazing, down the hills, over ditches, around trees, and they're not doing bumper cars. They're not stop and go. They're not like on the traffic on a freeway. They can seamlessly get together. I got to witness that every morning, sometimes at a dead run, following along behind these horses with Lightning and Leon. It was an amazing thing. I didn't know how much it would impact me years down the road. At the time, it was just important to bring them in. It was just to get, the, you know, to get ready to go have breakfast and get to work that day. I spent the next few years at the ranch, and then I found myself on that drilling rig. When I was in that hospital in Plastics and Burns Unit, like I said, I was 19, I wanted a new track, and I wanted horses back in my life. Just a few years before that, I'd been exposed to some concepts around horsemanship, which was called natural horsemanship. The idea that you could develop a relationship with a horse, that you could have a, a communication with a horse or a partnership that was based on communication, psychology, understanding of the animal versus the older ways of fear, intimidation, or mechanics. So that was in that hospital. I knew I wanted to be back with horses because of my history. And it was something very important for me to be able to dream towards something versus just all the anxiety and all the worry about what was going to come of my life. 
So with the idea of natural horsemanship and the love of horses, I started to, or after I, as I got home and dealing with all the things that we were, we were, you know, with the pain and the swelling and the nurses and multiple surgeries, I kept dreaming of horses. I would watch videos and I would study. I didn't know how much the mind could take over the body. I was healing, things were getting better. I was several months in, stitches were out and the steel was out. Uh, they took nerves out of my leg, they took other things out of this leg and they put it in there and, and I started to regain use and I was going to physio. And life, you know, people were asking me, what do you want to do? Where are you going to go with life now? And you know, the workers' compensation board was, you've got to pick a new job and it's not going to be horses. Who's going to do work as, you know, horsemen? That, that's, you were born 100 years too late for that. I was driving my truck down the road one day and I was on my way to an appointment for a physio appointment and I, I had those images come back so strong of those moments I was in that truck driving down the road looking at my self bleed out. It came back viscerally strong. I pulled my truck over, I laid on the seat of my bench, there's a bench seat and a little Ford Ranger, I laid there and I don't know if I was there frozen for five minutes, 35 minutes. I got going again and I realized I needed help started going to see a counselor and for the next several months I seen this wonderful lady who started to help me understand my mind, understand trauma, understand post-traumatic stress and what happens to people that are faced with this type of situation when you see that go on for so long. She was a very wise woman. She, she knew I was making progress and I was. Things were getting better. But she said one night, do you want to go visit with my husband? He does Aikido. In a little dojo he studies Judo and he loves to study Aikido. His name was Osam Kasahara. And I said, I would love to do that. It was a mental break. It was to, something else to do. And Osam was a great guy. He would stretch my hand and we would talk Aikido. And Osam changed my life at that time. He gave me a piece of information that I've used the rest of my life. We were sitting there one night and he could see I was visibly depressed. And I was telling him, I just can't get back to who I was. I can't find that person again. And he said, Jonathan, we're at a stage now, buddy, where you literally have two choices. You have the cho choice to suffer. You have the choice to heal. And at that point, I didn't realize it could be my choice anymore because at that point, everything was out of my choice from the moment that thing slammed down on my hand. Whether it was the pilots that flew me to Vancouver, whether it was George who lifted off my hand, Carlos who drove me to town, my nurses, my doctors, all those people that were there helping me. Whether it was Annette, the lady who was helping me with my figure this out. When I realized that I could maybe have some impact, I started going towards more of my dreams, more of my goals. What do I want to do? Forget what I want to do in the end. You know, what do I want to do for a career? I just want to go do something that I wanted to do. And it was about that time that Hal came in my life. He's a special horse, and he was a bit of a challenging horse. He was really sensitive, uh, but not very confident. We are both similar at that moment. <laughs> and I started to put my natural horsemanship study and the skills that I watched in the videos and so forth, I started to put towards Hal. And I had a dream. I wanted to be able to ride my horse. Uh, as naturally as I could. For me, I now wanted them to be with me as much as I wanted to be with them. It wasn't about the ribbon. It wasn't about the job. I just wanted to be with horses. And to be able to get to the point where I could ride Hal with no saddle or bridle was a dream come true, to be able to go out in a pasture as naturally as I could. But there was something missing. The reason that I knew there was something missing was because each day when I watched those horses come down, galloping down that hill, they were synchronized. There was a connection there. And Hal and I had a great connection, but there was still something missing. And I, and I, was, I, I kept racking my brain, what is it? What do horses have that I can't seem to get with Hal? And I realized what it was. The synchronicity to this partnership is, is they have an ability to sync like a, like a flock of birds, like a school of fish. I guess the easiest way to explain it is almost <laughs> using a totally other idea here, which is these snowbirds, Canadian demonstration team. See, these planes, when they synchronize like this, they're all stacked together, like a flock of birds, like a school of fish. And as they do, if one plane goes up three feet, another plane goes down, they're going to clip wings. There's pressure all around, but they hold inside a little place of comfort, a little sweet spot, I call it. I don't know if they call it that or not. But if they can't yield from pressure all the time, because if one pressures against the other, they're going down. They end up finding a way to hold comfort, hold a spot of comfort, right? hold a place that's not just all from pressure. I realized that what I was doing with Hal was I was doing half of the relationship. Most of it was from pressure. So if I wanted to turn Hal to the left, I could lead the pressure on my left rein, or I could press with my right leg. And when he would go to the left, I would press, I would press on this side. To go to the right, I would press on this side and lead with this rein to turn him to the right. It was pressure. But I started to try something different. I started to find a place of comfort for him. So I would simply open my left leg 
And if he didn't go and open the rain, if he didn't go, I'd press him over. And he'd find comfort there. I'd make sure there's a little spot, a little physical sweet spot, like an actual place where there's relief. Well, pretty soon I'd open my right leg, and he would move over to the spot, and I wouldn't have to press him. And we started to synchronize in a whole different way. We looked the same, but Hal was connected now. It was an unbelievable difference. We were able to start doing even cooler things. This here horse is not bred to do this. He never sniffed this. It was a big jump. And, there was a, and all I have is a string around his neck. He never looked at it once. He did two strides out of a hole. He jumped up, and I looked at it, and I said, there's a sweet spot on the other side. I didn't physically I didn't say that out loud, but I had put a sweet spot on the other side of these jumps. Every time I went over, there was comfort over there, Hal. He pulled me over that jump, and things really started to change. I knew I was never going to be able to get to fly with those snowbirds and be in synchronization with those guys, so I thought I'd make my own to be able to, you know, I'd be in the middle of my own herd. Uh, and all of these horses uh, are all in a little spot, a very clear location. That day I remember one of my mentors, and it was probably the first time I really felt it. He said, sometimes you can't tell where you stop and your horse begins. I remember that day because I would just look right, and all of them would synchronize and look right. I would look left. And sometimes there's pressure with horses, for sure. But it can't all be about pressure. At this time, I was starting to realize this major difference in Hal, the major difference in the way Hal and I were communicating. And I was still, I knew I, I was making progress and I had these dreams that were coming true with horses, but I knew I really wasn't myself yet. I knew, just like with Hal, there was still something missing. That's when I began to ask, is there a sweet spot in my life? Am I heading towards what I'm, I'm a place of comfort? To me, I, I know when I'm in my sweet spot in life, when I find myself on a path, that's because of my goals, my dreams, my heart's desire, because of love, because of positivity, not because of my fears, my anxieties, my worries of the past, because of being small-minded, because of all these different things. I know when I find myself on a path that is filled with those things, and that's where that quote resonated with me from Nelson Mandela. May your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears. Every choice we make every day every choice we make with the people around us. It's a moving target. To me, it's not an end destination. I always had a bit of a struggle when I was reading these books about you know, how to get better and how to pick what you want to do. They always talked about, what do you want to do in your you know, one year, or two year, or three year plan? I couldn't, sometimes it was hard for me to see the tips of the grass, let alone shoot for the stars. I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do for my two year plan. So I want to share with you, you know, three steps as I look back on it, how I, started to you know, overcome some of those issues and just in my own life experience, uh, what changed for me. And these three steps, they're not in an order because I find I pick up on one part of them uh, different times than the other to try to find that place where I go, yep, I'm on the right track. Even though I'm covered in details, even though there's pressure all the way around me, yeah, I am on the right track. That's what this whole weekend has actually been so uh, exciting to be here because you can hear people who are compelled for their message. They're not, they're not here because their boss made them come. They're not here because of money. They're not here. This is, they're compelled to do something. That person's in their sweet spot in their life. They're there because their heart's desire is pulling them there. The, here are the three things, movement, energy, and space. Now, starting with space, sometimes you need to kick a little space around you. <laughs> How is reinforcing his sweet spot <laughs> to Quincy? And horses play rough. That's the pressure side of their relationship. <laughs> Sometimes, I'll give you a recent experience. Sometimes when we're overwhelmed with things. Recently, I had just finished a tour. I travel, and I just finished a tour, and I had done three straight weeks at our ranch with all these people, and we had a wonderful time and all their horses. And I was, it was Sunday night, and I was driving, and it was late, and uh, I had... I was out of cell service, so I hit cell phone service, and my phone was just bing, bing, bing. I mean, just going crazy. And it was, you know, 9.30 at night. I was thinking about the next day. I had just finished all these things. And I was driving alongside the road. I said, what is going on? Have I, got, have I got myself off track here? Like, I'm feeling like, I'm almost feeling anxious. I'm feeling highly stressed. I pulled the truck over, and I looked at it. I just said, i got to stop for a sec. I looked at everything in my life. I said, all the facets. I go, I wouldn't want to move. I wouldn't want to take one of them out. Every one of these pieces of my life I want right now. And I know I'm covered in details. I know I'm swimming in it right now. But I just need to stop for a sec. I need to go back and celebrate the last three weeks of success. Not just take a selfie of Facebook post and go next. I need to stop and soak that in a little bit. Like we just had a great three weeks with our horses. We had a great three weeks of teaching, great three weeks of learning. 
I sat looking over the Nicola Valley for a minute. I turned my phone off. I drove the rest of the way home, just giving myself a little space, allowing me to start to get to where I wanted to get moving. I sat there for, I sat there as long as I wanted to before I got back in that truck and started to drive. In the end, it was 10 minutes. But when I got back in the car, I rolled down the windows, I drove over the hill, and I was in a totally different state of mind. I just had to stop, had to push that away a little bit. For me, that was really important. The next one, sometimes it's movement. Sometimes, at certain times in my life, it was just one foot in front of the other. It was just get up, put one foot in front of the other and get a coffee. I recently had a visit with a friend of mine. She was in the service and she was dealing with a lot of uh, issues after she left the service. And she said, Jonathan, sometimes it wasn't about movement forward. It was just about not going backwards. She said, sometimes I just had to get up that day and have a shower. The hardest part about going that day to go have a shower, and that's all you did that day, was not to say to yourself, all you did today was have a shower. Because if all you did last week was lay in bed the entire week, a shower that day was actually forward progress. It was actually not slipping back. She goes, the hardest thing was to do was to accept that that was my sweet spot that day. I got up, I moved towards life, and I found myself in the shower, and I went back to bed. Maybe the next day, it's more. Movement to me is where I can start. If I have a difficult horse, horse is really challenged, before I start locking horns with them, or they might have all kinds of issues in their worry or the past, I just get them moving. With the movement, I can change the energy. I can start to influence where they're heading. And to me, I want to be asking myself, am I heading towards my dreams, my goals, my heart's desire? That's how I start to ask that question when I'm dealing with, am I changing the energy here? I've got movement going. Am I heading towards, not because, I'm not going on this path because of my fears, but because of my goals, because of where I want to be, because of who I want to be, the people I want to be around, how do I help them around? My goal for you, or my goal for anybody listening that this resonates with, is that when you find that sweet spot in life, that you recognize that it's a moving target. It will continuously change throughout your life. It changes when we have kids. It changes when we don't have kids. It changes when we're dealing with post-traumatic stress and these type of things like I was dealing with. I remember, I remember vividly dreaming, hoping, praying, anything I could do to go back in time and change what had happened to me. If I could just stay at the Red Coach Inn that day and not get up to go to work, if I could just have stayed and not gone to work with George that day, I could have, maybe if I could have just moved my hand at the right time. I remember saying that for probably two years. And as I started to go towards my sweet spot, as I got help from Osam and the various people, all the family and the support I had around me, my life got to a point where I went, I would never, ever want to go back through it again but I wouldn't take it out of my life now because of the opportunities and the place that I got to go as a result of that, including this today, including this, sharing this with you today. If I took that accident away and I took those moments away, I wouldn't be where I am at in life today. I wouldn't be able to have the relationship that I do with horses now and understand them the way I do. So my goal for you is, you, is for you that you find your sweet spot in life and when you do, you help others. You try to celebrate a moment that they're winning. You try to find a, a moment where you go, hey, this is looking really good. Can I help you along down the path? Thank you very much.